Uh, welcome. I'll be talking to you today uh, regarding pressurized autoacoustic emissions and overcoming the effects of middle ear pressure. I am John Ellison. I'm with the Interacoustics Academy as a clinical trainer. And uh, feel free to use this contact information to get a hold of me with any questions, queries. Uh, in today's talk, we have three primary learning outcomes. The first will be to understand the mechanisms and limitations of autoacoustic emissions. Uh, two, to understand a benefit of measuring autoacoustic emissions at peak pressure. And then three, I'll provide a demonstration uh, with the measurement of transient emissions and also distortion product emissions and compare those against the non-pressurized measurements. I always like to start the talk with why, uh, even though I haven't really presented any of the information yet. Uh, hopefully I'll, I'll kind of uh, clear a lot of the information up for you during the talk. But, but why would we want to pressurize autoacoustic emissions? And the first reason is, is that it improves the detection of OAEs. I, I will show you that uh, in the coming slides. By improving the detection of OAEs, you're also able to evaluate cochlear function by mi minimizing the impact of deviant, which means positive or negative middle ear pressure. And by doing so, this uh, stands to reduce false positives in screening outcomes for sensory and neural hearing loss. When you have ambient pressure in the ear canal and ambient pressure in the middle ear, uh, the transmission of that uh, energy to and fro those, those cavities, those areas, are most efficient when they match. And this facilitates the most efficient means of measurements uh, that require access into the inner ear via the middle ear which just so happens to be most measurements for audiology. And if you have negative middle ear pressure, which is denoted by the minus signs in the middle ear here, uh, and maintain your ambient pressure in the ear canal, there, there is a mismatch between the two. Sound conduction suffers, and as a result, any measurement that you may take that relies on sound conduction across the two systems will also suffer. And that by matching the negative pressure in the middle ear in the outer ear space, then you thereby restore the efficiency of sound conduction and, and improve the, the measurements that you're, you're obtaining under that system. Uh, and this is not a new concept by any means. Um, pressurized measurements are common, uh, and actually the standard procedure when you're considering the uh, analogy to the acoustic reflexes, which are typically obtained um, at the tympanic peak pressure. This also uh, requires a, a, a system that is capable of manipulating the ear canal pressure, uh, which is typically not a system that OAEs are embedded within. And fortunately for us, we have a device uh, in our acoustics, uh, the Titan, which can measure OAEs and also manipulate ear canal pressure, which uh, it's kind of a happy marriage between the two. Next, I'm going to provide a very brief overview of the anatomy and physiology of OAEs. And for more information, I recommend that uh, uh, you, you visit the Interacoustics Academy site and view the OAE and introduction webinar. And I'm also talking a little bit about absorbance as well. And for that reason, I also recommend uh, looking at the uh, why band tympanometry theory and benefits webinar as well. And th these, these webinars provide a little more detailed information uh, than, than what I'm going to provide in, in this talk. With the, the auditory system, uh, peripheral auditory system at least, uh, we have a, an outer ear, a middle ear, and an inner ear. And as sound transmits into the outer ear, outer ear, it goes through the middle ear via mechanical energy, enters the inner ear via the oval window, um, and the cochlea, or the inner ear, is essentially a fluid-filled cavity uh, that's coiled up. And when that cavity is stimulated, a membrane vibrates. And this picture is showing a cross-section of that, of that uh, tube, that coiled tube. And if you look a little bit closer, we see that there is, uh, this is a, the organ of Corti, and we'll notice that there's three cells. These are the outer hair cells that are embedded into the tectorial membrane, and there's the inner hair cells that are not embedded in the tectorial membrane. 
So when you have vibration uh, uh, of the cochlea along the basal membrane, this will vibrate and it will, and uh, the outer hair cells will respond by enhancing, enhancing the response at that frequency, thereby enhancing the response of the inner hair cells and the, the information, the neural information that is then transmitted on along the auditory nerve and to the brain. Uh, the cochlea, importantly, is also organized by frequency along its length. And so if you take that coil and roll it out, uh, you see that the high frequencies are represented at the base. Um, and these are by hair cell, outer hair cells that are sensitive to high frequencies. And at the apex, there is also hair, hair cells, but these hair cells are sensitive to the low frequencies. If you look at the cross section again, the outer hair cells, the three rows, are here, and you can see that there's a connection with the tectorial membrane. If you look at uh, the, the, the basal membrane from the top down and stripping off the tectorial membrane, you'll see three rows of outer hair cells, and you'll see one row of inner hair cells, which are denoted by this one little row, and these are each individual hair cells. This slide intends to communicate that for a given frequency, activation of certain outer hair cells results in activating certain inner hair cells at that same frequency, more so than for other hair cells represented by other frequencies at different regions along the basilar membrane. This animation from this website is helpful for showing the effect of activating an isolated region along the basilar membrane uh, that is enhanced by the activity of the outer hair cells. Uh, it is possible to trace the shape of that active wave along the basilar membrane. And this tracing is sometimes referred to as the envelope of the traveling wave and is responsible for communicating certain frequency information to the brain. This active process creates energy of its own that is transmitted back to the base of the basilar membrane through the middle ear via the acicular chain and back out to the ear canal. This sound that travels back to the ear canal is the otoacoustic emission. And so there's two primary ways of, of measuring otoacoustic emissions. The first that, that I'll discuss is distortion product otoacoustic emissions. And, and, and what we have here is uh, we have uh, two tones, two simultaneous tones that are presented. Uh, these are referred to as F1 and F2. Uh, they're usually very close in frequency. Uh, usually if you, the, the ratio between F2 over F1 is about 1.2 to 1.22. And when you present these tones, you, uh, you get a, 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 an envelope pattern on the basilar membrane itself. And it's within the overlap of these envelopes that the OAEs are generated. And this is just showing that in this graph down here, low frequencies to high frequencies and the two tones, and you have your envelope patterns, and the OAE is the, the, the dark area. Now, when the OAEs occur in this area, it generates distortion products all along uh, uh, the frequency range, even though it's generated in this region. And the one that we typically measure is the 2F1 minus F2 component, which stands as the, the largest uh, distortion product. Um, so that's why we measure it in the clinic, even though there are other distortion products that are also generated as well. Um, again, if you want more information, please refer to the OAE introduction webinar on the Academy website. Uh, the next measurement is transient evoked otoacoustic emissions. And this is generated by using a click stimulus, which by its nature contains a, a broad representation of frequencies. And so what will happen is the click is presented to the ear and it will stimulate a large portion of the basal membrane, which then travels back out into the ear canal. And that recording in the ear canal, it has three primary components in that recording. The first is noise, the second are reflections, and the third is the OAE. And so what we typically have to do is we have to present the measurement many, many times. And by doing that, the, the noise will decrease. And further, if we are presenting three clicks of equal amplitude and then a fourth click of re reverse polarity at three times the amplitude of the first three, if we sum all of those components together, that sum will equal zero if you have a truly linear system. This removes the reflections. So what you have left is the OAE, and the reason why you have the OAE left is because 
the OAEs are nonlinear. So uh, one important aspect of OAEs is that the stimulus tra travels through the middle ear on its way to stimulate the outer hair cells and the response then has to travel back through the middle ear bef before uh, arriving back into the microphone. And this is true for both distortion product autoacoustic emissions and also transient evoked autoacoustic emissions. So sound conduction via the middle ear is important for most tests of sensory neural function, including audiometry and auditory evoked responses. These types of measurements only depend on forward transmission via the middle ear for a response. However, the measurement of OAEs depends on both forward and reverse transmission via the middle ear. So one could say that OAEs depend more heavily on the integrity of the middle ear relative to the aforementioned tests. So in sum, uh, OAEs depend on the, the health of the outer hair cell function and an efficient sound conduction pathway uh, through the middle ear and, and the outer ear. And again, uh, this information, it doesn't give any indication of inner hair cell function or information about the acoustic nerve. Um, because the response is dependent on uh, a healthy cochlea or a normally functioning cochlea and also the sound conduction through the middle ear, uh, when you get a refer, it, it, it can be inconclusive because you don't really know if the result is because of a middle ear issue or if it's because of an actual cochlear dysfunction. And in order to get a pass, it would be ideal to get a pass uh, such that you create a, a free and an easy path to go through the middle ear. And a pass in, ideally would, would mean that there's an absence of positive or negative middle ear pressure. And it just so happens to be that negative middle ear pressure is the most common dysfunction of the middle ear. So just to discuss how negative middle ear pressure uh, can impact uh, hearing, this is just showing a figure by, by Sun uh, and, and also by Erlinson who actually took the, the hearing threshold data. And this is just showing that hearing thresholds at low frequencies down here are actually worse with negative middle ear pressure. This also affects the OAE response actually greater than what the hearing threshold would suggest. And if negative middle ear pressure is bypassed, outer hair cell function can then be evaluated via the OAEs. So this is the section of the talk that I'll review a lot of the literature. First, I'm going to talk about the effect of middle ear pressure uh, on distortion product emissions, and then I'm going to discuss uh, the effects of middle ear pressure on transient evoked emissions. And you'll find that they're, they're rather similar. But to start, Sun uh, in 2012 investigated the distortion product emission level in normal ears uh, with, involuntary, with, with voluntarily produced negative middle ear pressure and with equivalent positive and negative pressure induced into the ear canal. They investigated 27 normal ears across 16 subjects. And the data is presented in this uh, graph such as this. And so this is showing dB along the y-axis over the F2 distortion product frequency. And the zero mark denotes the baseline condition which was obtained under the absence of any deviant middle ear pressure in ambient conditions. So that's kind of your ideal scenario. And then these other uh, lines denote the, the application of either positive ear canal pressure or negative ear, ear canal pressure or uh, negative middle ear pressure. And so what these results suggested was that positive ear canal pressure follows roughly the same effect as negative middle ear pressure, which suggests that to simulate negative middle ear pressure, it's best probably to use positive ear canal pressure. Specifically, the effect of, on, on distortion products was that uh, in the region of F2 frequencies between 600 hertz and 1500 hertz, uh, and also 3,000 hertz, that the, the distortion products were reduced. And each of these panels reflect a different range of deviant pressure. So in other words, this is the, the most mild case in the upper left, and the most severe case is in the lower right. 
they also found that uh, for, for larger um, deviant pressures, the positive ear canal pressure and the negative middle ear pressure had some positive above zero responses at 8 kilohertz, uh, it, although it was not significant, which suggests that there's a, a stiffening of the middle ear system, uh, thereby giving more passage to the higher frequencies relative to your normal ambient condition. And as I kind of alluded to before, uh, when you apply negative ear canal pressure, this is not the same effect as you would get if you had positive ear canal pressure or negative middle ear pressure. And that is shown in pretty much all of these panels in that the two lines are overlaying each other are the, the positive ear canal pressure and the negative middle ear pressure. The one that's a little bit deviant from the other two lines is the negative ear canal pressure. And, and this is probably a result of the differing effects of how you're, 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 you're interacting with the ossicular chain. Um, in one, one method, you're, you're, you're likely changing the volume more than the other. Uh, and all of this is going to have some impact on the, the resonance of the system and, uh, and, and its sound conduction. Uh, but it's a very, it becomes a very complicated issue. It's, it's somewhat challenging to predict. Uh, so there's another study, uh, Zemian in 2003, they applied pressure in the ear canal across uh, the range of minus 200 decapascals to positive deca uh, 200 decapascals. And, and this is showing the, um, the normalized, which is zero, uh, ambient measurement, which is kind of like a baseline. And then as you deviate from the side of, of this peak here, that's the application of the positive and negative pressure and they looked at the relative level relative to baseline. And they looked at all these different frequencies, F2 frequencies, 1000 hertz, 2000 hertz, 3000 hertz, and 4000 hertz. They found that average slopes for the left half of the data, or the case where you're applying negative ear canal pressure, that the OAE response dropped by 4.3 dB per 100, 100 decapascals. And the average slope for the right half of the data was approximately 5 dB drop per 100 decapascals. Uh, this data showed a larger effect at 2 kilohertz relative to the sun studies, but it did have a similar effect uh, as sun found um, by applying positive and negative ear canal pressure in the sense that the larger effect was shown for the application of positive ear canal pressure. Uh, Sun and Shaver examined 36 normal adults uh, and they wanted to see the effect of middle ear pressure on distortion product uh, OAEs uh, to validate the effect of compensating for negative pressure on distortion product emissions. The graphs are, are shown as exactly the same format as the previous Sun study that I, that I discussed. And uh, they found that uh, uh, negative middle ear pressure does reduce distortion products uh, when you use an F2 frequency below 1 kilohertz, which is all shown as this line here relative to baseline. For pretty much all of the uh, ranges of, of negative peak tympanic pressure. Um, specifically, when you had a, a negative pressure between minus 40 and minus 95 decapascals, you get about a 4 to 6 dB reduction. However, you get about a 10 to 12 dB reduction when you have uh, a greater magnitude of ne uh, negative middle ear pressure. So minus 160 to, to minus 420 decapascals. So it, it does increase up to a point uh, as you decrease your negative pressure. And again, 3K shows that it's, it is sensitive to pressure effects uh, in the middle ear. And as you decrease your pressure below 160 decapascals, again, you see this uh, little increase at 8,000 hertz, albeit an insignificant uh, increase. But the important thing I'd like to uh, hone in on in the study is that they applied compensation in the ear canal to match the middle ear pressure, and they found that it restores the OAE response to the baseline condition, or very close to it at least. So you can see that in all cases, uh, it does restore the response. I'm going to switch gears now to the transient evoked odoacoustic emissions. And 
This is a, looking at a study by Naive et al. in 1992. And they investigated how changes in ear canal pressure altered the intensity and spectrum of the transient emissions in nine normal hearing adults. And this is just showing the actual level of the emission across the different ear canal pressures. And the story here really here is the same. Um, when you have uh, ambient conditions, your response is largest for all presentation levels. And then as you apply either positive or negative pressure, you get, not surprisingly, a reduction in the amplitude. They also found that deviant uh, ear canal pressure resulted in a reduction of uh, reproducibility. So this graph is showing the percent below 0.5 criterion for re reproducibility. As you see that the zero decapascal, that the bar is the lowest, and, and as you increase or decrease the uh, ear canal pressure, you get worse reproducibility scores. They, these authors discuss a, an effect of a, um, a high-pass filter with the response uh, as, a, as a result of, of negative and positive ear canal pressure. And specifically, they, they talk about a 4 dB per octave drop as you in, go into the lower frequency range. Uh, as you approach 2,000 to 3,000 hertz, you don't get a, a big change uh, as, a, as a result of changes in ear canal pressure. But the low frequencies, again, are, are the frequencies that are, that are primarily affected. Uh, Trine et al. in 1993, they studied the effect of negative middle ear pressure below minus 100 decapascals. And they were also looking at uh, an effect of compensating for that negative pressure. And so relative to ambient pressure, the overall level of the emissions uh, improved by about 1 to 7 dB. Uh, by compensation of negative middle ear pressure. So each of these black bars represent the level for different pressures across individuals. And then when they compensated, they actually had an increase in the response, overall response, by these um, shaded bars here. It was somewhat variable, but in terms of the magnitude of the improvement, but um, the improvement was, 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 was consistent across their subjects. Additionally, they also found there was an improvement in the reproducibility uh, when they compensated for negative middle ear pressure. And that pressures below minus 100 decapascals, their amplitudes improved by 15 to 5 dB from 500 hertz to 2 kilohertz. And so it should be noted that the zero line here uh, is what you would get with compensation. So this is plotted a little bit differently in that this is the loss that you get when you um, have negative middle ear pressure that you don't compensate for. And their data is shown as the solid black dots. Another effect of, of negative middle ear pressure is that it will affect the stimulus and the spectrum of the stimulus. It's hard to see here, but there's a little bit of ringing in the stimulus when you have negative middle ear pressure and you get a, uh, a sort of a jagged spectrum uh, in the ear canal when you don't compensate for negative middle ear pressure. However, when you have a, um, a stimulus here in the case of uh, compensation, the little bit of the ringing is gone and the, the, the spectrum is smooth, which is what you ideally would like for a broadband click signal. Um, Hoff et al. also investigated uh, the effects of compensating negative middle ear pressure on the transient evoked otoacoustic emission amplitude, and they also looked at phase. Uh, the, their their stud subjects were between the ages of half a year to nine years. And they also found that compensating for negative middle ear pressure increased the amplitude and also the phase lag, and, and, and they improved the, the transient evoked detectability. In ears that had a, a middle ear pressure range from minus 120 to minus 40 decapascals, there was an average increase of around 8 dB with compensation near 1 kilohertz, which is right here. Um, in ears that had negative middle ear pressure between minus 200 to minus 120 decapascals, they showed an increase, a larger increase uh, of about 11 dB near 1 kilohertz. Below minus 200 decapascals, there wasn't much of an improvement that was uh, shown. So it, it does appear that, uh, from this study at least, that the, um, the relationship was somewhat asymptotic. So now I'd like to kind of switch gears uh, onto the effects of 
uh, screening outcomes. Uh, there was a study by Sanford et al. from Boys Town in 2009 that investigated how uh, screening outcomes via distortion product emissions related to the efficiency of the sound conduction through the conductive pathway, or, the, or in other words, the middle ear. They uh, investigated uh, 455 ears, so, so it was a pretty significant study size. And they uh, calculated peak tympanic pressure in, in two ways. One was using the wideband uh, tympanometry method, where you average the, uh, the peak admittance um, from 800 hertz to 2000 hertz. And they also had a, a procedure that they also used to panic peak pressure uh, using a one kilohertz tone. And this is showing that um, with the, the pass group, which is the top row, um, the, the, they had peaks from zero to 25 decapascals for both of these methods. Um, and that uh, the mean for the pass group for the wideband tympanometry method was uh, 21 decapascals for the pass group and 95 for the refer group. And then for the one kilohertz method, there was a uh, mean of uh, 41 decapascals for the pass group and uh, a mean of 124 uh, for the refer group. So, so this is just suggesting that uh, this has a direct implication on the number of passes that you get in a, uh, a screening protocol. And actually, they, they refer to a, a study from Keefe in 2003 that showed ears that were referred uh, under a two-stage DPOAE ABR or transient-evoked ABR universal newborn hearing screening protocol that ears that passed an ambient absorbance was twice as likely to have a sensory neural hearing loss uh, than an ear that was referred uh, on the ambient absorbance test. So in other words, the, the likelihood that you're actually testing the integrity of the cochlea um, is, is very much affected by the sound conduction pathway. And these results suggest that negative middle pressure can impact passing rates uh, for, for newborn hearing screenings using distortion products. Uh, Preev et al. also uh, looked at how transient emissions uh, were impacted um, across 11 children. And what they did is that they, they followed the same child for each of these 11 cases, uh, all with normal uh, functional cochleas from when they had negative middle ear pressure and also from when they had normal, uh, normal middle ear pressure. And then they found that the transient emission levels were actually affected. So this result is the level dbspl for the abnormal tpp the abnormal peak tympanic pressure and this is showing the level for for normal peak tympanic pressures and they actually found that there was a pretty consistent decrease across the frequencies from one kilohertz to four kilohertz they also found that the pass rates were improved using a snr criterion of 6 db so if we put true numbers to this, um, they found an increase of 6% from 72 to 78% by compensating uh, for negative middle ear pressure. It may actually make a difference in clinics that have very high volumes. So, so the summary of all of this information and the impact of middle ear pressure on transient evoked and distortion product emissions is that we, we see that deviant middle ear pressure reduces the OAE amplitude primarily in the low frequencies. Uh, and then also deviant middle ear pressure affects the OAE stimulus. And it affects uh, transient evoked reproducibility and that compensation restores uh, the OAE amplitude to uh, baseline levels. And as a result of this, it, it may be that compensation would improve screening outcomes. So the next step is I'd like to show you, uh, I'd like to demonstrate uh, this technology using the Titan. And I'm going to show the effect of negative middle ear pressure on distortion product emissions and transient evoked emissions. And, and I did previously record this demonstration because I, I found it was incredibly difficult to a, generate negative middle ear pressure using the Toynbee approach. And then even more difficult was to maintain that negative pressure. This is just to show that I actually have negative pressure. Uh, I did a wideband tympanogram on myself. Uh, using the Toynbee approach. And um, going to the distortion product screen, I'm going to take 
a pressurized distortion product measurement. And I'm looking at uh, the F2 frequency range between 1 kilohertz and 8 kilohertz, which is uh, a little extended than what you normally would do, but I just wanted to show the effect here. And notice that I get a, a pass on my 1 kilohertz response, which is exactly what I was hoping for. And so I'm going to switch gears here, do a ambient distortion product emission, and I also speed up the, the demo because I'm just trying to save a little time here. And you'll see that I don't get a pass at one kilohertz. So this is, a, this is exactly what I was trying to show. You, you, you do get, um, it does make a difference in the low frequencies. I was just trying to show that I, that I still have negative middle ear pressure and I did a wideband tip on myself and the negative pressure was hasn't really changed a whole lot and then also wanted to show the absorbance the absorbance here would also uh, looks a little bit similar in that yeah the sound conduction uh, is diminished in the low frequencies which is denoted by the the gray line as opposed to the, the red line uh, the red line is the compensated value you get a little bit of an enhancement in the high frequencies And this is what I'm doing now is I'm showing, I'm overlaying the data, which is a nice feature uh, in the Titan suite, that the two responses can be compared directly on top of one another. And you'll see that the low frequencies under the pressurized measurement are increased. Um, and you do get a little bit of a, uh, a decrease in the high frequencies, which we've seen uh, on a lot of the, uh, the studies that I had reviewed previously. And it seemed to be a pretty consistent outcome in, in, in my ear. This figure is showing pressurized versus non-pressurized absorbance. And it's the same concept as the distortion product emission when it was obtained at peak tympanic pressure as opposed to when it was obtained at ambient pressure. And so those that aren't familiar with absorbance, it's simply the amount of energy transmitted through the middle ear en route to the cochlea. So in other words, if you have a response that's near the top of the graph or 100%, that just means that all of the signal that was presented to the ear has been absorbed by the tympanic membrane, middle ear, and route to the cochlea. However, if you have a response near the bottom, or at 0%, that just means that all of the signal that you presented to the ear has been reflected back into the microphone or the probe that's situated in the ear canal. And this is just showing absorbance across frequency. So in other words, if you have the red line, which is your peak tympanic absorbance as opposed to the gray line, which is your ambient absorbance. This just shows that in the frequencies located in the pink region, this area has higher absorbance or, or greater transmission, a greater acoustic transfer of energy through the middle ear relative to the response obtained at ambient pressure, which is the gray line. And the blue shaded area is where your pressurized response is a little bit smaller. And you kind of see a little bit of correlation here uh, to the absorbance view. The red line is showing that the, uh, is, the, is the compensated absorbance value. And the gray line is the ambient pressure in the event of negative middle ear pressure. And yeah, sound conduction, as I mentioned, is degraded for low frequencies. So now this is the transient emission demo. I took a wideband tympanogram uh, demonstrating that I had a negative middle ear pressure of around you know, roughly 112 deep decapascals and first took a pressurized TEOE measurement which I've circled there and I'm, I sped up the demonstration just to save a little time 
And I went through the entire two minutes. It, it, this is not often necessary, but I just wanted to, to be fair to both, both methods. Um, normally, you would stop once you get a response. And you'll see I already have a response for three of the, the, the frequencies, three of the bands. And I'm not going to get one here for the 5 kilohertz band. Okay. So now that was pressurized. This is going to be, um, t I'll take another wideband tympanogram uh, just to demonstrate that I still have negative pressure. Still there. And then we're going to go to the non pressurized transient emission response. And one thing you might notice too is that the the spectral characteristics are not as smooth as they were when when I was doing the pressurized measurement. So and interestingly, I got a slight increase at 5 kilohertz, and in this case, it actually resulted in a pass at that frequency for the non-pressurized measurement relative to the pressurized measurement, which was uh, a little interesting. So again, I'm showing uh, the fact that I still have negative pressure, and I'm going to compare the two responses. Uh, within the Titan suite, and I'll show you the absorbance along the way. Same story. Uh, you have reduced sound, reduced conduction uh, for low frequencies, which is demonstrated by the absorbance uh, plot. One thing I, I, I really like about the Titan suite, which I, I, I demonstrated here, is that you can actually change the um, the analysis, the frequency analysis. So. Um, this is your default view right here. It's centered around the different octaves, but you can change the default. Uh, you can change the uh, the view for uh, to one be one third octave, one sixth octave, one twelfth octave, and if you wanted to kind of get a, a finer resolution on the on, on the responses and and maybe what exact frequency is contributing to uh, a particular response that may pass or fail at one of the bands. So I'm just kind of showing here that there's a sixth octave. And I'm going to toggle between non-pressurized, which is here, and pressurized here, non-pressurized, pressurized. And then I'm also going to show, just for, just, just to be complete, I guess, I'm going to show you the 1 12th octave response. So this is the non-pressurized response and the pressurized response. And the overall response, as you can see, is, is increasing under the pressurized measurement, primarily uh, dominated by the lower frequency regions. Uh, it's the high frequencies which, uh, which uh, show a little bit of a, a reversal in that trend. One characteristic that can be observed compares the pressurized versus non-pressurized transient evoked emission stimulus spectrum showing that the spectrum is smoother in the pressurized condition as opposed to the non-pressurized condition. You can also see less ringing in the pressurized condition as well. So if you go back, I wanted to sort of plot these side by side just to get uh, an indication or, or an idea about how the pressurized compares to the non-pressurized. And I just traced each of these bands under the, the 1 6th octave view. and uh, if you look back and forth here, you, you do get a, a difference. And when you plot that, you have an advantage in the low frequencies of roughly 5 dB. Uh, this is, again, just showing uh, uh, the absorbance and how the absorbance uh, is a good uh, way to assess the, the conduction uh, across these two, two different conditions. Uh, so that, that brings us to the end of uh, the talk. I, I'd like to open the floor now for, for any questions. Question is, uh, what do you see as the main clinical applications for this technology outside of newborn hearing screenings? I primarily see this as a way to improve your clinical confidence. Um, if a clinician is not able to 
acquire or or get a an OAE response, then that might be because there is a cochlear involvement or a or, or a presence of negative middle ear pressure. Um, however, if you're able to in, uh, compensate for your negative middle ear pressure and you're still not getting a response, this increases the clinician's confidence that the lack of response actually has more to do with a cochlear involvement. So at the end of the day, I think it just improves the um, clinical confidence primarily. And also you're able to optimize your low frequency response. Question here, the wideband TIMP I think explains quite well which frequencies are going to be more affected in the OAE results. This shows another example of why wideband tympanometry and DPOAE are great partners. I couldn't agree more. Thank you for the questions. If you'd like to delve in a little bit more into the materials that I've presented today, here's a list of references. All right, well, everyone, well, thank you very much for, for listening to the webinar. I hope it was informative.